All right, so this is our last lecture in heat exchangers. Um, if I take a look at where I'll usually get follow-up questions from either students or alumni, it's in heat exchangers. It's in heat exchangers. And a lot of times they'll ask me a question like, hey, I'm working in this plant, and this is what somebody said to do to promote the heat transfer, change this outlet temperature. And I argued with them. It's happened a number of times where people have you know, engaged me in conversations about heat exchangers and wanted to know were they right or what should they do or and it's not very straightforward heat exchangers you think old technology easy right but it's it can be a little conceptually challenging so today i hope to uh, explore um, some aspects of common heat exchangers so this is a very, very common heat exchanger. I mentioned it before. You pop the hood of an automobile. What are you looking at? What is that radiator? It has liquid on the inside, and it's heavily thinned, and it has airflow on the outside. So it's a cross flow with air and water. If you have a cross flow air and air, you've got to have thinning on both sides to really have a good heat exchanger. All right. But when you have liquid on one side, put it through the tubes. No thinning required. Right? High H. Why is it a high H? Liquids have high thermal conductivities. There you go. But once you're in the fins, in between the fins, you stay in that passage. Hence, the two fluid streams are unmixed. So it's the terminology that you get familiar with. Unmixed cross flow heat exchanger where air is on the outside and thinned tubes are on the over the flow on the outside. Okay, so here is a, a quick sketch in the illustration, and we had the equation for the effectiveness as a function of C sub R as well as NTU, or you could plot that equation for different C sub R's as a range of number transfer units, and so you can visually, if you're given the thermal size of the heat exchanger, come up, get the right C sub R ratio, come across and read out the effectiveness. The effectiveness is Q. It's related to Q. It's the rate. So if I'm doing it this way, you're rating a given heat exchanger. If you turn it around and say, I desire this much heat transfer, maybe I need it here, I get an effectiveness. I come across, I come down, and I just determined the size. Can't spell size, let me try again. S-I-Z-E. You determine the size of the heat exchanger, so you rate it or you size it. For this equation, for this um, two fluids unmixed, there isn't a nice analytic expression of N to use as a function of effectiveness C sub R. If you needed to do that in a computer code, you'd have to iterate. You'd have to have it iterate to solve it. There's no simple expression. Uh, at least in our textbook, there, somebody may have put one out somewhere else in the literature, but it's not in our textbook. And I, I don't think it's in most textbooks that I've seen. I, I just haven't seen one that I recall. All right. So we have a cross flow heat exchanger. It's used, this is very, very common, nothing tricky here. Used to heat air. It's using hot water to heat air. So water flows, you're the design engineer, put it inside the tubes. Air flow on the outside where you can easily thin it because you need to promote the heat transfer on the outside to help it. That's the restriction. So even after you've thinned it, yet, even after you've done it, the overall thermal resistance is still dominated by the air side. Is it dominated by the wall of the material? No, it's a good aluminum, it's a good copper, brass, heat exchanger. No, it's not dominated by that. It's negligible heat resistance to heat transfer in the wall. So we ask you to write an equation for U. Most of us would start and would say, I'm going to write it for 1 over UA. Why 1 over UA? That's resistance. The reciprocal is conductance. U could be called, you know, oh, it's overall heat transfer coefficient, but UA is like a conductance. 1 over UA is resistance. And so we have resistance. Most of us think with resistors pretty naturally. Conductance is a little tricky. 
because we have to go out of the one fluid through the solid and into the other fluid. That's three resistors in series, and you add resistors in series. So we would have 1 over, let's say, H on the inside, area inside, plus some resistance due to the wall, plus 1 over H outside, A outside. This is negligible. This is negligible from our problem. And this one's not negligible. So what do we do? We fin it so this A becomes the total finned plus the bare surface area. It's a total area right here. Let me change that subscript to total. So you can think about the area total is the area fin plus area bare. It's, you still have some parts of the, that are exposed. right? And then you have an eta, eta naught. What's that eta naught? Efficiency, the overall efficiency of our thinned surface. So that's overall efficiency. Now what we can do is we say, oh, I can see what U is. U is simply the eta naught, H naught. And then depending, you want to put the area, the same areas here or not, that's fine. Put the area, area. Just UA. Then you have, that's a bad looking eta, area total. So the overall heat transfer coefficient for a very common type of heat exchanger is proportional to the convection coefficient on the outside. Is that? The uh, why is the the H on the outside, the air side, so low? It's because the conductivity of air is much, much lower than the conductivity of water, and the H's are proportional to K's. Yes? Uh, is the area on the left hand side the same as the area total? Uh, this U has to be defined in terms of an A. So you can define the U in terms of the total area and it would be the same, then you could cancel it on both sides. But some people may define U with a different area. So uh, the, the main part is, is not so much the areas. I know I need the total area here. It's whatever is the matching area because U is defined as watts per meter squared degree C. What meter squared? That's the matching uh, area. All right. Well. I have the same paragraph, don't I? We have a cross-flow heat exchanger. It's a very common configuration. You're going to heat air. You're using hot water. You're going to fin that air side, but you still, the overall thermal resistance is dominated by the air side. With that information, ready for clicker? Here's the clicker question. How will the overall heat transfer coefficient U change if the mass flow rate of air is increased. Will it increase? Will it have a negligible change or will it go down? And this type of question I get asked a lot. You know, what happens if we change the mass flow rate? What's it going to do? All right, so we just have to recall the equation we just developed. There was a lot of thought behind that, developing that equation. But it's, it's basically as U is proportional to the H on the air side. And how does the H on the air side, how would you calculate? Well, I'd look to calculate the, get the speed of the flow, get the Reynolds number on the air side, some Reynolds number. Probably it's turbulent. Most naturally it's turbulent. Then look for a Nusselt correlation. Then get the Nusselt number. Then unravel the Nusselt number by having K over some length scale, probably some diameter, hydraulic diameter, okay? Put D sub H. So do you see the pattern there? So this would be typically some constant Reynolds number to a power, Prandtl number to a power. If somebody said you can't, you have no access to a textbook, what should be roughly that power on the Reynolds number in a Nusselt correlation? 0.8, 0.8. It's for turbulent flow over flat pellet average. Look at it's 0.8 in our 
go to the external flow chapter. And then for the internal, it's 0.8. So it's that. How about one coefficient on the Prandtl number? Uh, a third. Just throw a third. Between 0.3 and 0.4, a third. A lot of correlations have a third. You're right. Some, the Dita's both are 0.3 or 0.4, depending on heating or cooling. All right. So how about this Reynolds number? Well, you think about the Reynolds number being some rho, V, some hydraulic diameter over mu, or think about the 4m dot over pi d mu. I mean, it, the V is proportional to m dot. If I have more speed, higher speed, I'm moving more <coughs> mass through it. True? So it's linearly related. So if I, if I have a 10% increase in the mass flow rate of the air, how much did the Reynolds number go up? 10%. And then how much did the Neusselt number go up? 1.1 times to the eighth power. It'll be not quite 10%, right? And then how much did H go up? 1.1 to the 0.8. That's how much it went up, the H would go up. So everybody, I hope, we're able to say that we do have an increase. The U is increased, true? You ready for the next box? All right, here goes the next question. How will the overall heat transfer coefficient U change if the mass flow rate of the water is increased? All right, so we just have to go back to this line of logic. Now the line of logic would be that on the water side, if I increase the mass flow rate on the water side, the mass flow rate of the water goes up, the velocity of the water goes up, the Reynolds number of the water goes up, the Neusselt number is proportional to the Reynolds to the 0.8, so if Reynolds goes up, the Neusselt goes up, if Neusselt goes up, H is up. But, told me I got a pay raise. It's 0.00001%. Am I gonna go take my wife out for a big dinner and celebrate? It's negligible. I think we all understand it. You've walked in a convenience store, right? You're buying something for three or four dollars. You look down, there's a penny on the ground. You don't even slow down to pick it up. It's negligible. <laughs> so, yes, the H on the inside of the tubes went up, but it has a negligible effect. True? True. All right, four, five, six, seven of us got to get on the same sheet of music here. All right. This table really helps you because it puts things in perspective. There's just this line I want to focus on first. So you have an overall typical value for the overall heat transfer coefficient U. If you have a water-to-water -water heat exchanger, water inside the tubes, water outside the tubes, water between plates, things like that, oh, I would say, Throw me one value, pick one value out of that range. What would you say? 1,000, 1,100, 1,200? Yeah, 1,000. All right. Now let's jump to the bottom. You have a very common, you get a lot, a lot, asked a lot of questions about this type of heat exchanger. What is it? The one we're talking about. Finned tube heat exchanger, water inside the tubes, and air is in cross flow. Look at the value, the range is the lowest of all the table, isn't it? 25 to 50. Again, it just reemphasizes what we're talking about. And so you could double the water flow rate. It's not going to help promote heat transfer. If you change the air flow rate, it will. How many people ever had an automobile? They swapped the engine. I did this when I was young. Oh, I don't have time to put that fan shroud back in. Anybody done that? Yeah, I did it too when I was young. You too? All right, when you're driving that car down the highway at 60, 70 miles an hour, they put the radiator in front, the air flows across the radiator, everything's good. Go to the red light. Oh, the train tracks. And my gauge just kept going up and up and up, and I wished I had put that shroud in. And I did later. Happened to you too? 
But yeah, you think, oh, it's a cheap piece of plastic, not needed. But it draws the air through that radiator. It works at a stoplight. It's not needed when you're going 60 miles an hour down the road, but it's definitely needed. Actually, they do now, they have electronic fans, right, with a nice shroud, and they kick on when that's needed. Otherwise, they save the electricity. I just want to beat up this topic a little more, okay? So here we go. There is a classic plot demonstrating the nonlinear characteristics of a coil used in this building, plenty of them all over this campus, used all the time. And what they're doing is they're heating air in the winter. I could do the cooling coil, which gets a lot more use in South Texas than the heating coil. But when you have a cooling coil, you have condensation when the air drawn across it gives, is moist and that adds just an extra complexity. There's no condensate on a heating coil. So we can use the tools that we learned here to understand what is widely known in the heating, ventilation, air conditioning industry, that this is nonlinear. So here it is. We have uh, maybe um, 100 degree F, 190-ish degree F uh, water. And it's gonna drop about 20 degree F 20 uh, delta T of about 20 degrees F across the coil. And it's used to heat air. Air in the winter, you, do, you want it warm to come into the room. Maybe your design is to bring it in around 95 F. Uh, maybe it's coming in to the coil around 60 F. You say, why is it so cold? Because they draw return air out of the building that's 70, but they exhaust some of it. They have to make that up with outdoor air which could be very cold outside, hence the blend is a little cooler than the 70 degree that's inside the building. All right, that's the cross-flow heat exchanger. They're all over. There's three or four of them in the mechanical rooms just in this building by itself. So the, you design this to work on the really cold days, but most days are not really cold. So you modulate it, you throttle back. One way to throttle it is it's easy to control, put a valve on the water flow and just reduce the water flow. So you design everything and you have it 100% is on the coldest day, but you reduce the water flow to 50%. Hot water flow goes to 50% or 30% or 20%. You don't change the inlet temperatures. You don't change the airflow rate. And then you just predict from the equations, what's the Q by throttling it back? When you go down to maybe 70%, the heat only went from 100 down to 95%. So you had a huge reduction in the flow rate, but not a lot of the heat transfer in that heat exchanger. So what you pick up is this very nonlinear curve. This is all for 20 degree F temperature drop. What's the temperature drop of 20? the water in the design. If you design it to have a larger delta T from 20 to let's say 60 or 80 degrees F, then it's not as nonlinear. But you don't want a lot of cool water going back to the boiler. You want to keep the boiler pretty uniform in temperature such that there's not a lot of thermal stresses and shocks. So it's a blend of, of things. From a heat transfer point of view, get all the heat out of the hot water, send it back cold, cold, cold to the boiler. But from a boiler's perspective, let me just, you know, bring it up a little bit. All right. So I implemented this in Excel. So here it is. So I just put in the 91.11, so I want to work in SI units and put in the specific heat of water. Notice the specific heat of water and compare it to air. How big a difference is it? Four times larger. Yeah, water is much higher specific heat. So if I put in a design, I picked the U I picked before and the A I picked before and my design temperatures I picked before. But this mass flow rate, I color coded this cell because I'm gonna change it in a minute. But I just said just one kilogram of water, I can scale from there. The heat capacity rate, and then I need to calculate, or I need to have 2.3 kilograms of air for that one kilogram of water. And that now has been picked, it's gonna stay constant. 
the area is going to stay constant, the flow rate is going to stay constant, the U is going to stay constant, but what I'm going to do is move off of the design uh, load by reducing the mass flow rate of the hot water. So we have the two heat capacity rates, and we can jump over here, get C min. I think you can see how we do that. You just take the minimum of these two cells, take the maximum of those two cells, get the ratio, get the number of transfer units, get the effectiveness from that equation, calculate our Q max from T in hot, T cold in, and then heat, minimum heat capacity rate, and then Q, and basically that is our 100% design. It gives us our desired outlet temperatures. But what happens if it's 0.9? Well, my ratio of Q to the design Q is now 99%. The temperatures of the hot did change. The temp out and the cold did change out, and some of these other numbers in the calculation changed. But all I did was reduce the mass flow rate of the hot. Make sense? All right, very good. Now let's ask some questions. Now we play the game. On this plot right here, the, the, the x-axis, it starts at 100% and it goes down. What are we reducing on the x-axis? Water mass flow rate, right? In, into it. On the y-axis, we plotted Q before, normalized to the reference Q for full design consideration. But now on the y-axis, plot the outlet air temperature in degree C. What did the outlet air temperature in degree C start at? Started at 35. Maybe this is 35 right there. So does the outlet air temperature of the cold fluid, as I reduce the mass flow rate, does it go like this or like this? Well, let me try and draw a couple cases in here. Let me try this again. Does it look like this, like this, like this, like this, or like that? Answer A, B, C, D, or E. Did I give you enough options? It starts at 35. For A and B, they're eventually going to go up. It's going to go up as I reduce the mass flow rate of hot water. For D and E, it goes down. Uh, and C says there's really no change. It's going to stay 35. All right. Uh, we had the plot where Q compared to 100% when it was operating as a function of M dot of the hot fluid. As M dot of the hot fluid went down, what did Q do from 100%? It went down, right? Then it go kind of flat and then down like that. So let's see. If you have a uh, Q is equal to the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid, temperature cold out minus temperature cold in. Is that always true? So the temperature of the cold out is equal to the temperature cold in plus Q divided by cap C of the cold. Did uh, the inlet temperature of the cold ever change? No. Did the heat capacity rate of the cold air change as you reduced the mass flow rate of the hot water? We only changed the mass flow rate of the hot water. Did we change the mass flow rate of the cold air? So did C, so cold change? No. Did this change? Yes. It did change. It went down. So now can you tell what's going to happen to the cold? Going to drop. Going to drop. And probably the closest would be E. It's going to be very gradual drop, and then finally it'll taper off. It's not like a straight line or anything right away where it's nearly... You know, 10% reduction gives you a 10% reduction or anything. So let's go ahead and uncover this right here. And uh, erase a lot, but you could tell right here, there's the curve. 
that we're looking at. Well, I put 35 up here in the plot. Doesn't it look just like Q? So, grade it. Isn't D the best? Yes or no? You like A? <laughs> okay. Well, you really like this game, don't you? Yes. How does the hot water outlet temperature change? Oh, you're not changing the mass flow rate of the air, the either of the inlet temperatures. All you're changing is the mass flow rate of the hot water. You're reducing it. So, I need to give you some options, huh? How about, how about if I just do this for from, from my options? Is, uh, it's going to somehow increase A, remain unchanged B, or eventually decrease. Only three options. What we're plotting over here is the temperature of the hot out. It was 80. It was 80 under design conditions. We're reducing the mass flow rate of the hot. Reducing the hot flow rate. Remember our valve? There's some valve right here. We're starting to close that valve. You thought heat exchangers were simple. B is pretty flat. C is just tending down, A is tending up. Well, what type of equation do we have? We know the general trend between Q. What's Q doing? Down. So what's the relationship between Q, the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid, the temperature hot out minus temperature, whoops, in minus temperature hot out. But this is also changing, isn't it? But this is proportion this is this is linear with respect to M dot of the H. Ten percent reduction in M dot of H, ten percent reduction in heat capacity rate of the hot fluid. But this was constant for a long time. So which way is it gonna go? Get rid of that. It goes down. So it's going to come out at 70-some, and then 60-some, then 50-some degrees C. Make sense? All right. All right. How does the minimum heat capacity rate change? What do you mean by minimum heat capacity rate? Well, that was a parameter C min. That was the minimum of the C of the hot fluid and C of the cold fluid. Which one had the minimum heat capacity rate at full design conditions? Either the water or the air. The water's hot or the air is cold. Which one has the minimum? Jump back to my slide if I could find it. So the minimum two, let's put it at one. 230. 2,322, and it's on the air side, right? Very good. So it's on the air side. But what's happening as you start to reduce the mass flow rate of the water? Heat capacity rate of the water is the specific heat constant pressure of the water times the mass flow rate of the water. True? So without a clicker question, what's it going to do? He's good. He's good. That's not trivial, is it? Why do we have it flat? Because all in this range, it's all being controlled by the minimum is equal to the air. Exactly right. But eventually, the water is cut back so far, the mass flow rate's reduced so far, that finally now the heat capacity of the water is the one that's the minimum. Then it starts to come down linearly with the mass flow rate of the water. I didn't ask a clicker question on it. I felt that was a little too challenging. Let's do another one, though. Number of transfer units. What is the definition of the number of transfer units? U A over C min. Did you change? Nope, we're not changing you at all. How about area? Nope. C min? 
Yes. So let me just ask a quicker question. It'll eventually go up. The number of transfer units will go up. Answer A. Stay the same. Answer B. Or go down. Answer C. The general trend. Maybe I should draw it over here, right? Either go up. A. B. Or C. Increase. No change. Decrease. Now the time to just see what we got. Why does it really stays pretty flat and then it eventually goes up, up, up? Because uh, while it's, uh, it has to get below air, it's like a weather drill. It's yep. stays flat and then once it starts going down, it's going down exponentially. That's right. That's right. So there's no end to these games, is there? What about the ratio of heat capacity rates? Do we want to clicker at this or not? Yes. All right, you want to clicker on it. Let's do it. This is going to go from 0 to 100%, isn't it? Isn't C sub R, the ratio heat capacity rate, is going to go 0 to 100%? It's going to start at about 50%, 0. 0.556. Is it going to go up, stay the same, or go down, A, B, or C? Uh, these are really challenging. If you're not getting a lot of them right, that's okay. All right? I know they're challenging. This is just all fun, extra credits, not like 10% of your overall grade, right? As you start to reduce the water flow rate, the heat capacity rate of the hot is going to go down, but it was the maximum. But eventually, it will equal. It will eventually get to a point somewhere in this vicinity where they switch and the minimum now is not the air, but it's the, so between here and here, something happens, it goes up. But what happens after it hits that magic spot? It goes down. So, you know, I felt bad asking the question, but it's kind of up for a while, then down after that. Let's take a look at the plot. Isn't that crazy? That's what it does. It's going down linear because uh, you're not changing the air, and you're just changing the minimum proportional to the mass for later of the water. That's why it's linear, right? Yep. I don't know. Let's take a look. Oh no, the effectiveness. What? Oh, I didn't grade it. Let's go ahead and grade it. It was uh, A. True. I didn't grade the last two. Are you joking? Which one is this one? <laughs> just, just go with the crowd. <laughs> Fine. Sorry. I, sorry about that. Now let's focus. I'm going to run out of time. What do we have from the y-axis now? The effectiveness. What's the effectiveness defined as? The effectiveness is the actual Q over Q max. Always think about what's defined as. It'll help you tell the trend. It's going to go between 0 and 100%. What did it start at? A whopping 23%. It starts over here at 20%-ish, right, when it's full. So what's the effectiveness going to do? Is it going to go up, A, remain unchanged, B, or go down, C? Interesting, isn't it? I could try and explain it, but I think I need to move to a plot. I don't know if I have it on the next page or not. Let me just grade it. The best answer is A. Hey, it looked like most people thought C. But um, let me see if I have a next plot. Yeah, this, is, this helps explain it. This helps explain it. But that one started off black. Yeah, and this is, this is why. I'll explain it. Okay, where did we start graphically on this plot? We started with an NTU of about 0.34. Where is that? It's kind of down here, 0.34. 
All right, the C sub R is about a half. It's we're at in, a, in this plethora of five curves, right about the middle curve, but they all join together, and they're right about there it is. See that? Given us uh, effectiveness even below that, 0 0.23 or 0 0.24, 0 0.24, below 0.3. So that's the starting point. Then as you started to reduce the water flow rate, it dropped straight down because the number of transfer units is not changing, C min isn't changing, until it hits the ratio C sub R of 1. So it drops from this point straight down to that point. There's not much of a change in effectiveness. It's very flat until you've got over 50% or more, or roughly 50% of the mass flow rate of the water has been reduced such that now C sub R is 1. So you move, think about it, if I would have had it way out here at NTU, it would have gone from here down to there. But we're tight right in there. So it's like no effectiveness ch change in effectiveness. Now the tricky part is, now that you're C sub R of 1, but now you continue to reduce the water flow rate, what does C uh, of the hot fluid do? Continues to go down linearly. And the ratio of C sub R now goes down. It was 1, it goes down. Because the air now is the maximum, it stays constant. And you're, you have UA divided by C min, which is now going down linearly. So you're going to start going up in NTU, and you're going to go C sub R from 1. It, it walks like this. Kind of bad plot. Um, if you feel like somehow I've been unfair to you, sorry. But heat exchangers just are not that trivial. I mean, and hopefully you gain something out of these what-if games. Because, uh, again, I've, I'll just share. I get a lot of people who come and ask me questions later, after they pass the class or before the class even. And you may be asked a lot of questions about this type of heat exchanger. and What happens if this happens or that happens? So hopefully that helps. Thank you very much for your attention. We're done with heat exchangers. Wednesday is the exam.